Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem and today we are in the dark because we are going to talk about musica ficta. The issue referred to as musica ficta is one of the most infamous topics in the research of early music. Mostly it refers to the practice of altering certain composed notes with accidental notes, based on theoretical knowledge and performance conventions. The difficulty is that this knowledge and these conventions, both nowadays and in old times, were not always completely straightforward, and sometimes even contradictory. In this episode, we'll see what we can nevertheless say about it. Let's start from the beginning. What is Musica Ficta? In our episode about solmization, we presented the gamut and the guidonian hand. These both represent a collection of notes, all categorized under terms such as musica vera, recta or regularis, that is, music that is true, correct or regular. Other notes, whether they be in between those notes of the gamut or simply beyond its range, are categorized under terms such as musica ficta or falsa that is, feigned or false. So, if you can't find a certain note on your hand, you can say that it is probably not in the realm of musica vera, but of musica ficta. A simplification of the matter would be to say that the white keys of the piano are musica vera, and the black keys, the accidental notes, are musica ficta. But this is not quite correct, as the note B both in its hard natural variant or soft flat variant, is part of the musica vera, it's on the hand. And if the whole system is transposed, as was the case sometimes, other black notes will be also part of the musica vera. Now, in order to arrive at ficta notes, one can transform musica vera notes by replacing their solmization syllable, one can apply the syllable fa or mi to notes that normally don't have these syllables, and by that, change their category. Using a fa syllable on a certain note is equivalent to adding a flat to it, and using a mi syllable is equivalent to adding a sharp, or if it's used on the note B flat, it will cancel the flat. Nowadays, when we refer to musica ficta, we don't necessarily refer to notes which are in the realm of musica ficta. Mostly, when the term comes up, it is in the context of a need to alter some composed notes. Notes that based on theoretical knowledge and performance practices should or even must be altered using a fa or a mi, depending on the case. Setting aside our own Ficta problems when trying to understand and perform early music for now, we should first understand why such alterations of musica vera were needed in the first place, in the stage of understanding and composing music. When using notes of the musica vera, one must beware of augmented and diminished perfect intervals, due to the fact that they were simply prohibited. For example, in this succession of four notes, there is a bad interval of an augmented fourth between the F and the B. I'll sing it using solmization syllables. La, fa, mi, mi. It is common to read in the sources that one should avoid having Mi against Fa. Indeed, when noticing the solmization syllables of perfect intervals, Notes with mi syllables against notes with fa syllables will always result in bad intervals. In order to perfect this fourth, we can either put a mi syllable on the F, and by this transforming it to an F sharp, la mi mi mi, or instead put a fa syllable on the B, and by this transforming it to a B flat, la fa fa. According to the sources, the preference in such a case is almost always towards the usage of flats and not sharps. However, now the last interval between the B flat and the E is a diminished fifth, also a bad interval. La, fa, fa, mi. 
should we now put a fa also on the E? And what if this piece is in a Mi mode? The whole mode will be ruined if we will alter the basic note of the mode. And let's say we do change this E to E flat. If it is followed by an A, will we then also have to alter the A? This example is just to show how Musica Ficta troubles are waiting at every corner of the Musica Vera, as inherent imperfections of the musical system and should be taken into account when composing music. This tension between Mi and Fa is evident in this generic and simple example of just one part, but you can imagine that in polyphony things get even more complicated, as there might be not only bad intervals in melody, but also in harmony. The use of Ficta in order to avoid bad intervals was regarded as causa necessitatis, on account of necessity. But there were other uses of Ficta, regarded as causa pulcritudinis, on account of beauty. Such use of Ficta is evident, for example, in the counterpoint rule or recommendation that dictates that when proceeding from an imperfect interval to a perfect one, a semitone should be used in one of the parts. The semitone, if needed, may be obtained through the use of Ficta notes, as in these examples. Other common reasons for the use of Musica Ficta were cadences, and also to allow a major harmony at the end of pieces. More about that later. Okay, so composers could use Ficta notes in order to avoid bad intervals, and also for other reasons. But how is this a problem for anyone? The material presented up until now was information needed for composers. It described ways they could or must use Musica Ficta when composing music. But as it so happened, it was the convention that the graphic signs indicating Musica Ficta, that is, sharps and flat signs, were not always used by the composers. Some wrote more signs than others, but generally there was no agreement on when, where and why some signs are written and some not. This was based on the assumption that musicians would have the experience and knowledge to decide when and where a ficta could or must be used. Not so surprisingly, this was not so clear to everyone, especially when the bad intervals are a result of what happens between the different voices, when the singers are not able to anticipate them, as they only had their own part. Pietro Aron, in 1529, put it so. Doubts and disputations are circulating among some lovers of music about the signs of B mole and diesis, that is, flats and sharps. Whether composers are constrained to signal them in their compositions, or whether the singer ought to understand and recognize the hidden secret of all the places where these figures or signs are needed. He continued and wrote that in many situations, one cannot know whether Ficta notes are necessary. Such silent intelligence belongs to God only and not to a mortal man, for it would be impossible for any learned and practiced man to be able to sense instantly an imperfect fifth or octave without first committing the error of a little dissonance. For this reason I say that those who do not indicate the sign of B mole where it might naturally appear to be otherwise, commit no little error, because an intention retained in the mind accomplishes nothing. Thus, Aaron is complaining about the convention of incomplete notation of the Fichte notes, and suggests, at least when correcting imperfect perfect intervals using flats, that the composers should mark them explicitly, and not to expect mortal men to divine the composer's intentions. In other places, he wrote that the explicit notation of sharps is necessary only for the sake of beginners, as professional musicians will know their way also without it. So, now you see the problem. Things were not clear and people were confused. In most cases, musicians were expected to use their experience and knowledge, and alter the composed notes of pieces using Musica Ficta. Let's see in what cases they were expected to do so. As we mentioned, the alteration of notes using Musica Ficta was divided into two main categories, 
necessity and beauty. Necessity is the correction of imperfect perfect intervals, that is, the transformation of augmented or diminished fifths, fourths, and octaves into perfect ones. This refers to melodic intervals as well as to these that occur harmonically between parts. By correcting, we don't mean to imply that it was wrong and we have now corrected it, but that the correct note was simply not explicitly noted to begin with, although expected by the composer. As we said, when you find a perfect interval where one of the notes has a mi syllable and the other a fa, it will inevitably be a bad interval that must be taken care of. In order to fix a pair of mi and fa, mostly the mi will be transformed into fa, that is, the mi note will get a flat, become a fa, and thus the interval will be normalized. If we are in an untransposed system, cantus durus, the flat in question will be mainly b flat, and if we are in a transposed system, cantus mollis, with the b flat in the key signature, the flat in question will be mainly e flat. A common statement in regards to ficta is that a single note above la must always be fa. In Latin it sounds better. Una nota super la semper est canendum fa. This rule is very often an implication of, or connected to, the general rule of the correction of the imperfect fourth. Aaron, in 1545, criticized the overusing of the fa above la rule by musicians, and stated that in fact the only situation where it is necessary to apply it is in order to sweeten the triton, addolcire il tritono. This is evident, for example, in the well-known melody Green Sleeves. Apart from the fact that the top note of the melody is a note above la, there is an evident augmented fourth between the F and the B. Indeed, if I were to perform that melody, I would have to sweeten the triton and alter the B mi to B fa, B flat. Of course, when several parts are involved, the consequent intervals must be also taken into consideration. Here is a common and generic polyphonic progression that calls for a ficta in the bass. Without the alteration in the bass, there will be a diminished fifth with the tenor, a bad interval, as well as a melodic diminished fourth in the bass. In addition, the fa above la rule also applies here, and demonstrates what Aaron meant, that this rule should be used in order to sweeten the melodic triton. To be sure, these kinds of alterations are something that the composer expected the performer to make, and has nothing to do with taste or artistic decision. This is a clear and easy case. There are, however, unfortunately, cases where there are some inner contradictions, and it's not clear what the composer meant. When altering notes for beauty's sake, we don't correct anything, because nothing is wrong. There are no bad intervals that need to be perfected. In such alterations, only the chroma, the color of the notes, changes. A minor third or sixth might become major, or a major third or sixth might become minor. It is just an alteration of one version of a consonance to another. Referring specifically to sharps, Santa Maria wrote that they originated to only lend grace and beauty to the natural melodic lines and that their use depends on the judgment and taste of the performer. Now, in many sources we are told that one should use fictas in cadences. Some sources were more specific than others, and say that in a cadential progression with the solmization syllables re ut re, sol fa sol, and la sol la, what we call cantitans clause, the syllables should be sung as if they were fa mi fa, that is, that the middle note should be sharpened. An exception to the rule, however, is that when la sol la is on the note e, or on the note a in cantus mollis, when there is a flat in the system, it should not be sharpened, as in such cases the tenoritans already proceeds by a semitone. As you see, Having ficta notes in cadences is not unrelated to the counterpoint rule we mentioned before, that when proceeding from an imperfect to a perfect interval, 
one of the parts should have a semitone. Thus, in normal hard cadences, the semitone is in the cantizans, and in soft cadences, the semitone is in the tenorizans. In modern discussions, it is common to use the term leading note, a note that is sharpened when going up or flattened when going down. Other than the so-called leading notes in cadences, also the final chord of cadences must receive a major harmony, although it's not always marked. As you see, Santa Maria's remark that the use of sharps depends on the judgment and taste of the musician is not quite true in these cases, it seems that it is quite obligatory to use sharps at cadences and final notes. Let's have a look at some examples of the usage of beauty fictas, brought up by Aaron. In both examples, the canto part is the same, but because of the context, the ficta alterations are different. Let's see. In the first example, there is a cadence to G. The canto has the tenorizans formula, and the alto the cantizans. According to the rule, the cantizans sol fa sol should have a ficta. In the second example, however, there is a soft cadence to E. The bass taking a soft tenorizans, moving by a semitone, and the alto taking the cantizans. Because of the exception to the rule mentioned above, that in a soft cadence there is no need for a ficta in the cantizans, no ficta is necessary. The canto part of this example, even if melodically identical to the one of the first example, lands on the third at the final chord, and therefore must be altered, to allow a major harmony at the end. Okay, so if we follow some of these rules, it is quite easily possible to recover both the necessary fictas and the beauty fictas, that are very often just as necessary. However, there are cases where things are not completely clear. We have an account of a ficta dispute that took place between some singers in the papal choir in the middle of the 16th century. Let's see. This example is taken from Joan Escribano's Lamentations, found in an unpublished music treatise by Giselin Dunkertz, dated from the middle of the 16th century. We are told that there were disagreements concerning this fragment. As you see, the only written out ficta sign is the B flat before the final cadence. This is an obvious causa necessitatis. Without it, there will be a diminished fifth between the bass and the canto part, Mi against Fa. The first obvious ficta alteration from the performer's point of view would be the final cantizans figure. And if there were a third on the final chord, it would also get a ficta. The ficta doubts concerns the cadential progression in the beginning, as well as its repetition in the lower voices. According to the rules we mentioned above, the cadential figure La Sol La should get a ficta. However, because there is a Sol one bar before that, it would be weird, at least in the period in question, to have the natural Sol immediately followed by its sharpened version. Sharpening also the first Sol to correct it would make a lot of sense and would look like a four-step cadence. The only problem is that it would force a progression of an augmented second from the first note, disqualifying this solution. If a hard cadence cannot take place, we can use a soft cadence by adding B flats throughout. This will be in line with the B flat already written in at the end. The actual historical dispute, however, was whether a B-flat should be added to the key signature or not. Some argued that the B-flat should be added throughout, but the writer of the treatise, Dunkert, believed that it should not, as this will ruin the mode. Check the footnotes if you want to read more about it. Regardless of the final opinion of the writer of the treatise that was never published, 
This example shows the historical variety of opinions on the subject. Very often, when Fichte is concerned, there are no absolute rights or wrongs, there are just opinions and arguments. Luckily, the unnecessarily confusing tradition of not marking the Fichtas was not taken over in intabulations. In intabulations, the notes that were meant by the composer, and sometimes even more than those, were always notated explicitly. Let's see. In one of the earliest prints of the Italian keyboard in Tavolatura from 1523, we can see that the Fichte notes, be they flats or sharps, are marked with little dots. One can differentiate between them according to the context. The explicit markings of Fichte gives us an idea of the norms, where Fichte notes were used and how the music sounded with it. This frees us from most of our doubts on the subject. The situation is even better when the intabulations are of vocal pieces. Together with the standard mensural notation that contains randomly few Fichte signs or none whatsoever, we have a contemporary source with explicitly written in Fichtes. A great example for such a case is the first book of Madrigals by Philippe Verdelot from 1533. The collection was printed in the standard manner of the time, separate part books with almost no Fichte signs. Three years later, it was published again, this time in an edition for one voice and lute in tabulation, said to be made by Adriano Villaert, a great and highly appreciated composer in his own right. The intabulations for the lute, as was standard where intabulations were concerned, include many Fichte alterations. So, if we look carefully at the intabulation, and mark in our original vocal parts the Fichtas that are expressed in the intabulation, we theoretically get a performance edition by Adriano Villaert. Let's have a look at the first musical phrase of the madrigal Se lieta e grata morte. I'll play it first without any Fichte alterations, as it appears in the original publication. Now I'll play it with the alterations indicated in the Lutin Tabulation Edition. As you see and hear, these alterations are all causa pulcritudines, on account of beauty. No mistake will arise without them. The next Ficta alteration, however, is causa necessitatis without which horribly bad intervals will take place. It seems that Villaert, or whoever actually did this in tabulation, was quite extreme with the addition of Fichte added for beauty. Let's listen to this section. This kind of medieval double leading note cadence is an extreme and rare example that cannot be found often in other sources from that time. Whether this is what Verdelot, the composer of the piece, exactly intended, or whether it is an exhibition of highly individual and possibly extreme taste on the part of the intabulator, we cannot really say. When there is no clear correction of a bad interval, and there is no clear cadence or final note, it is very probable that in such cases different performers chose different interpretations. One could claim that this might be another tool for the performer to interpret the text, that one can add or avoid beauty fictas accordingly. In this case, the harsh mis of the ficta comes very consistently on the word morir, an appropriate connection in Renaissance terms. However, I don't know of a source that refers to Fichte as a tool for artistic interpretation. Regardless, one may learn a lot about Fichte from such intabulations of vocal music, as it is a true window to the elusive past of Fichte. By the end of the 16th century, Aaron's wish for a fuller marking of the Fichte was more or less fulfilled. In any music before that, however, Musicians had to use their discretion and knowledge when using Fichte notes. 
hoping that they did so more or less according to the composer's intentions. This was our show about Fichte. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. Feel free to comment, share and like, and see you next time at earlymusicsources.com.